Seahawks fans, wherever you may be. Thanks for listening to the show. Join your hosts, Bill Alfstead and Keith Myers, as we talk Seahawks football. Hey, hi, Seahawks fans. Welcome back to another episode of the Seahawks Playbook Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Alfstead, sitting down with Keith Myers, co-host Keith Myers, here to talk Seahawks football, previewing the Seahawks uh, visiting the Los Angeles Rams for the second game in the series this season. Uh, Seattle fell on the first game of the season to the Rams at home after building a halftime lead um, and then just got wiped out in the second half of that game. Uh, We were left wondering what in the heck was going on with our team. What team did we have? Did we completely miss um, on forecasting uh, how good they were going to be and how good the roster was? Um, And then they've kind of come back and and built a six and three um, lead uh, in the division uh, tied with the 49ers um, and looking pretty good in the NFC overall while the Rams started out strong in that game, but uh, are sitting at three and six. So kind of polar opposites uh, as far as the seasonal direction goes. Uh, how you doing? I'm doing good. And uh, just looking through all of um, the stuff, trying to figure out what happened in that game. What can we expect? What's going on in, in um, for the two teams right now and, and all of that. It's <clears throat> that game, the result of that game still makes no sense because everything you see is that Seattle's a better team. And yet they just got the floor you know, wiped out, wiped with them. And it's, it's really weird. Um, I mean, obviously occasionally weird games happen. It's the NFL, but um, it still doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, it happens, you know, during the Rams or not the Rams, the uh, Ravens uh, game as well. I just got wiped off the map uh, by them. Maybe if we Mm -hmm. were to play them two or three different times, um, it would be a different story and it would be a completely different game. I mean, the Cleveland Browns came out and, uh, and took care of business against them. So anyway, um, you know, I guess the question is here, can the Seahawks go out on the road against a division rival on a game that really they need to get, uh, considering the schedule coming up yeah, and, they, and get a win. The Seahawks really need this one. Yeah. It seems like it, you know, every week we say, well, it's a, it's a really important win. It's a, or a, a game must, must win. You hear those kind of words and superlatives out, out of our, mouths and others. Um, but it really is kind of one of those deals. Uh, Seattle could end up being seven and three coming out of this weekend. And I think that's going to be really important going down the stretch. The very next game is the 49ers on Thanksgiving evening, um, which will, is just going to be epic, you know, especially if Seattle can win this thing, it'll be a battle for the division and really kind of the future of the, of the season, uh, is in balance in, in these next two games. But uh, getting a little ahead of ourselves. And, and, and uh, also the Seahawks could, in fact, get a little ahead of themselves by discounting this Rams team, especially with Matthew Stafford coming back, coming back off kind of a, a thumb injury he sustained in the Green Bay game. He hasn't had a great season, though. He started uh, pretty darn strong against the Seahawks, especially in that second half. But overall, he's completing about 60% of his passes, um, throwing some interceptions. Uh, the, the kind of momentum that they had built up with their wide receiver group has kind of tailed off uh, lately, but they're still a formidable team and well coached. Yeah, they are. Um, I think, and I think that's um, that's the the part there is. It's a well coached team. Um, there is talent there. There's considerable talent there. It, there's not a lot of depth and there's a lot of holes, but there are, there is a lot of talent in certain spots and you just, you've got to be careful with that because uh, if you, if you let them guys like uh, Aaron Donald will just dominate you and you can't let that happen. Yeah. And they've got a new kid too, Byron Young. It's having just a tremendous season, probably on par with like boy, mm-hmm. Um in his second season, but, uh, Byron Young is in his first season there and they picked him up out of Tennessee. I really liked him coming out in the draft, um, had some off field concerns, some maturity issues. He's put those aside for them, really come in, 
taking the pressure off of Donald in the middle, or maybe Donald's taking the pressure off of him. And, uh, he's, he's racked up some, some really nice numbers. Um, in, in as far as their defense is concerned, that's about it. Um, their defense has kind of been their weak spot has been their weak spot this year. Uh, they've got some nice pieces. Uh, we just mentioned a couple of them. Akella Weatherspoon's there at cornerback. They brought mm-hmm. him in in the off season. He's having a really good season for them. Um, other than that, though, they're very much lacking in their secondary. Um, they've got a couple of linebackers, but again, kind of a turning over the roster there in the off season. And um, so that's definitely their weak spot. And on the offensive side, uh, they got a couple nice pieces, including Puka and Nakua, their rookie sensation wide receiver they picked up in the fifth round, um, who's definitely outplayed his draft draft grade. Um, and then Cooper Cup's back. Didn't see him in the first week of the season. He's back now. They're trying to integrate and figure that out. Um, so, but they do have, they, they concern me a little bit on offense. Obviously, they exploded against us in the first game. I just don't want to see us go into this game flat. Now, Pete Carroll is, this is kind of what he gets paid for, is getting his teams ready for these games that you you should win, you, uh, you're kind of forecast to win, and it comes up before these big, huge games. He, he makes sure his team's at least mentally in the game, ready to go, even for a lesser opponent, possibly. Yeah, and uh, I mean, this <clears throat> this is a big game. I mean, it, we, we mentioned it already, like, they better be ready. They better be prepped. Um, and you can't come out and do what you did week one again. Uh, and so, you know, just looking over this, you know, things uh, they're just looking at, you know, it's separate for, for Seattle. Um, you know, you've got, um, we know that Jarek Young has been ruled out. So we're the, the little gadget player that or not even little, but the gadget player that we thought maybe um, back after being activated off injured reserve, he did not participate in, in practice on Friday is listed out. Uh, Tyler Lockett is listed as questionable. Same with Jamal Adams and Trey Brown, although it sounds like Adams and Brown are, are good to go and we'll see about Lockett. But the, the, the bigger one there was, is Abe Lucas who's been added mm-hmm. to the roster and is now listed as questionable. So, there's a, he hasn't there's been officially to added to the roster. He's been designated for a return. Um, not yet counted on the 53. Um, and he's been also ruled out of playing this weekend. Uh, just hmm. just news out. And then they signed Jason Peters to the 53 for the rest of the season. So that's within the last half hour that that happened as we okay. sit here on Friday afternoon and record. Um, but yeah, so so... I mean, that's good news. I think that uh, Abe Lucas, he's probably going to be ready to go next week. They're going to have to make a decision there on Jason Peters, who's also been filling in uh, admirably. And then Bradford's back this week as well. He's good to go Sunday. Um, So it sounds like it's going to be Peters and Bradford uh, on the right side um, in this game, which I'm not mad about. I mean, that's a a pretty decent combo. It is. I mean, uh, Peters is smart. He's a veteran. He's also 40. Seven, I don't know. Forty-one. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's a. Um, I do like if you're gonna play Bradford there, who's a rookie, putting him next to a, the um, grizzled vet uh, of Jason Peters is not a bad thing, because Peters isn't gonna make mistakes. He might not physically have what it takes to get out and get to a, a outside blitzer or that kind of stuff anymore. He may not have like, he may not just have, have it physically like he used to, but he's not going to make mistakes. He's a really smart, good experienced player and putting him next to a guy like Bradford is, is going to be great for Bradford. And we already know Bradford can play cause he's done it. Um, I'm hopefully like, I'm hoping that the team does get Bradford out there and doesn't continue to play Phil Haynes because we've seen that yeah. show before and Bradford's the better player at this point. Although Phil Haynes, I will say, did have a good game last game. Uh, his his pass blocking grade led the team and, uh, you know, discount pro football focus, that's fine. But 
um, all things being equal, he had a pretty decent game. And, and um, you know, I thought uh, based on the, on the dropbacks that Gino had, really didn't see too much pressure except for that one sack he took right before the half. Um, so the, the Seahawks have played like six really, really bad quarters this year. And two of those came against the Rams. Mm-hmm. And how do you go into this game uh, mentally, Keith? How do you make adjustments, especially Geno Smith, um, to where you wipe the slate clean and you obviously uh, you're separated by 11 weeks of uh, football here in the NFL, which is a lifetime. Um, but how do you how do you just wipe that out of your memory and come back and really just focus and play a complete game against this Rams team on the road? Well, I don't think it's really that hard because um, it was week one. And yeah, there was a lot of bad football played. Uh, but then they turned around and beat the Lions the following week, which are uh, only have two losses on the year, one of which is that game um, against Seattle. So I think that you look at everything that's happened since then and the fact that the defense kind of found itself, except for the Ravens game, the defense really found has found itself um since then you know you've um you've added added um uh leonard williams um yes. and and jamal adams came and came jamal back adams and, and um yep. reek woolen has gotten healthier yes. and um you know you you they just keep getting the defense is is it's not the same defense um that they played in week one now they're going to try and and duplicate a lot of what they did, what the Rams did. They're, the Rams are going to try and duplicate what they did, but they ran over Seattle in that game. Since then, Seattle's been one of the best run defenses in the NFL. Um, okay, and then they took a major step backwards against Baltimore. Uh, but in between, and Kyron there, Williams really is not playing in this game. Kyron Williams had two two touchdowns last uh, last time they played. He's mm-hmm. out on injured reserve. Yep. And Cam Akers was traded as well. Um, I didn't know. Oh, okay. That's a whole nother issue. I just never understood how he was all, he seemed to always be in the doghouse um, mm-hmm. with the coaching staff there. Yeah. I think Cam Akers somehow had some mental uh, challenges uh, in the NFL. And that's all I can figure. And I've heard he's doing, those he's rumors. He's fine in, in Minnesota. So. Sometimes you just need to change the scenery and change your teammates and coaches. And mm-hmm. yeah. So uh, we mentioned that Seattle really needs this game. Uh, the 49ers are uh, technically in first place with the same record, six and three. And um, we play them next week after this Rams game, uh, including the 49ers uh, twice, the Eagles, the Cowboys, the Steelers, Titans, Cardinals. This is definitely a must-win game. I think Seattle really does intend to want to um, to go deep into the playoffs, to have a chance. I think uh, Pete Carroll came out this said and, and said they've got a championship opportunity. Of course, he's going to say that. But I think it's re- they really believe it, um, not only the coaching staff, but the team. And um, it would be a very difficult loss if, if they were to lose this game. But it's entirely possible. Um, against this Rams team and Sean McVay. I mean, if there's a coach in this league other than um, the, the coach for the 49ers just, lo- just went out of my brain, uh, that has Seattle's number, it's Shanahan. Sean McVay. Yeah, Shanahan. Um, it's it's just uh, you know, Michael Fleur's their, their offensive coordinator. Raheem Morris is a good defensive coordinator. They're well, like we said, they're well coached. Um, they're kind of an underdog mentality. There's a lot of people around the franchise uh, that cover the franchise believe that now that Matthew Stafford is back after a week off, um, that they can kind of regroup and put together a run. And it starts with this game against the Seahawks. Yeah, I mean, for them, they're they're almost a desperation mode at three and six um, because you've got to win this week. Uh, if you lose, you fall to three and seven, and then you pretty much have to win out. Yeah, you can't have season, a single slip. You're almost up. near elimination. <laughs> um, yeah, the whole rest of the season, if you want to make make the tournament. So, um, for them, yeah, they're in they're in 
they're in desperation mode, but for them, like every game is a playoff game. Um, just about they can, they can afford probably one more loss. Uh, so I'm, yeah, I expect them to come out and give their best look at Seattle. They're going to, if they've got trick plays, they've been holding in their pocket. They're going to be on the table this time. Um, because they know that they can't lose this game. Um, I hope that Seattle isn't complacent because you look ahead the next four weeks, going two and two in the next four weeks would be a major accomplishment and would show that you are a true like uh, championship caliber team. I actually think that that um, when you take a look at the records and just the records um, at, at six and three, Seattle is every bit as favor, favored as any of the other teams that we're playing, save the Eagles. The 49ers are six and three. The Cowboys are six and three. The Steelers are six and three. Those are the teams that we need to face and, and beat potentially. Um, and I think that we've got a pretty decent shot at it. I mean, we're really, we're talking about a, a fairly decent uh, offensive game by this team. Uh, if you're going to round out your, uh, your offense, uh, this would be a good time to start uh, because this, this run is going to need you to come onto the field and be competitive every game, not, not have two or three quarters in a game where you're going three and out, three and out, three and out. Um, that's just not going to cut it. Mm-hmm. Um, on the other side of the ball, we need our, our big players to kind of step up. Leonard Williams has been playing solid. Reed needs to to continue to play. Um, and Boye Mafe needs to kind of knock it out. Um, he's had seven sacks in seven straight games. I think that needs to continue for this team to have a, a shot. We need to be able to pressure the quarterback, get after Matthew Stafford, uh, force him into mistakes. Their offense has not been protecting him very well. He's only a 60% passers traditionally he's been closer to 67 percent in his career um but teams have been able to get to them there on on our offensive side i think we have talked about this endlessly but we need to be able to convert on third down we were four of 14 in our last game even though we were able to score and and um, move the ball around um but that's ranked 30th in the nfl with 31.48 percentage uh, third down conversions, which is horrible. We should be closer to 45, really, with the, especially with this offense and all these tools, all the weapons yeah. that we've got. So, yep, uh, agreed. I mean, that third down remains a problem. Um, I will note that uh, the CX are the favorite in this game, but only by one point. We've only given Seattle a one point margin, um, according to Vegas. So, that's um, that's an interesting under, interesting spot for them. I mean, I, you got to look at, at uh, location and all of that, but still, um, I would have picked Seattle to be. I would have expected Seattle to be a a, a larger favorite than that. I get it, though. I mean, you look at the history. You look at the coaching matchups. Matthew Stafford's coming back. Um, Geno Smith been struggling on third down conversions and all that kind of stuff these teams have traditionally played tight games. And so I'll be, uh, I think that we're going to come out and, and beat this team. Uh, there's certain amount of revenge factor here where I know Seattle feels embarrassed about how they played in that first game. And they want to come back and show um, the Rams that that's not in fact who they were. They, the, the Rams got lucky that day. And, um, so I do expect Seattle to come out and, and uh, have a good showing in this game. I think they can run the ball against this team. I think they can pass the ball against this team. I think they can score points. I don't know what happened in that first week, in that second half, um, where we were shut out, but I don't see that happening again, really. And then on the defensive side, um, our, our defense has been really playing pretty good. And this Rams offense is not as special as it's been in the past. It's a middling offense. It's a middling team. And we need to be handling our business on the road here. And I think, you know, we can probably get this thing with double digits um, if if things go the way that they should. Yeah. We've also both thought that week one, right? Um, No question. And so you look at, you know, you look at all of that. 
on paper, the CX are just the better team, top to bottom. Um, and there really isn't much of a reason why this game shouldn't be just an easy, convincing win. But do you trust that right now? No, going in? I don't. I but don't I, you know, I think I will after, if we do it. We need to go do it. I think we need to, you know, if in order for me to feel at all comfortable, um, uh, even if they win, uh, predicting some sort of like equal opportunity chance against the 49ers at home on Thursday night um, next week, they would have to convince me in this game that they are for real, that they're mm-hmm. a contender, that they want to win the division, not just be a wild card guy, uh, a team that, that backs in. Um, because that's what they would essentially be doing if they lose this game and they go on to split the gauntlet and then they wrap up with the Steelers and the Titans and the Cardinals and, and get those wins. You'd kind of, you'd feel kind of, okay, they got to 10 or 11 wins, but they just aren't a complete team. And these are the sorts of games where you just go and take care of your business and you come back and you beat the 49ers and then you beat the Cowboys And then all of a sudden you're starting to be looked at as a real threat in the NFC and that it's in their hands right now. We're six and three. We've got an opportunity here. Mm -hmm. It could go the complete opposite direction though. And that's the anxiety you kind of feel. It's like, which team's going to show up? If the Seahawks lose this game and then go into that four game stretch where um, things look rough, you know, because playing four four straight games against really good it teams. It could go real sideways. It could go, this thing, this whole thing could go sideways quick. And I don't, you know, want to predict that or anything like that, but. Um, and I don't think it's going to happen, but it could happen because in the NFL, anything can happen. And it's, it's hard to win in the NFL and the, uh-huh. and the four teams that are coming up past the Rams, the 49ers twice, Eagles, Cowboys, each, each of those teams, each of those games could go against us. Um, like we could also win out. Um, there's that opportunity. If I, the offense suddenly clicks the way it should, if Gino um, starts trusting his protection and uh, doing the things he needs to do, that with the talent that they have on offense, um, if that if the offense just suddenly clicks, this Seattle team could be an absolute force right now we're waiting we're still waiting for the offense to click defense can get the job done um most the question is can the offense yeah and i mean it's it's a chance um i was looking at i I would love to see abe lucas come in yeah because i think that he's he might be the difference there to to get this offense over the top i know it sounds weird like a right tackle what but, yeah, but that's the right the right tackle spot's been a weakness this year so far. He was the best offensive lineman on the team last year. I mean, it's more than it's not a reach. You suddenly turn so I have a, a weakness into a strength and you get the running game going and suddenly this offense looks way better. I do have a question for you though. Yeah. Uh, how did you feel about the use of the word chronic when Pete Carroll described his knee? Um I don't know. Um, from a medical standpoint, that sounds bad. Um, it's not a word Pete uses. And so therefore there's not a lot of history. If he said it was legit, then yeah, they might as well draft a left tackle, but he didn't say that. <laughs> uh, um, they, uh, and so I, I don't know. Um, we'll see if it is something that is a chronic problem where it's going to be a thing then it's going to be a thing. I mean, that's just the nature of it. Um, and maybe, uh, you know, they have to figure out how to uh, treat it and they'll do what Bobby Wagner does. And that's get those injections during training camp every year. And, and uh, in order to, uh, you know, keep it, keep it going for him. But we'll see. Uh, like I said, it, it's not a great word medically, but, Pete doesn't use those word, medical words in the same way that uh, medical personnel do. 
And so I'm not going to speculate given that it's just, it's not something that we have a chronic, we have a history we have a chronic history that we have a history of Pete Carroll using that in a certain way where we can learn to interpret. Okay. The, one of the last things I want to talk to you about in this game particularly is turnovers um, against Washington. Tino Smith was, was great. Didn't turn the ball over, no turnovers against Washington. But before that he was responsible, personally responsible for eight turnovers in four games, previous four mm-hmm. games. Um, which team comes out? Is, is it the team that protects the ball and um, is is the, in the positive on turnover ratio in this game? Um, or, or do you see this even being a factor? Well, you can't turn the ball over. Pete Carroll won't let you. Um, I'm surprised that eight turnovers in four games was something that Pete Carroll allowed. Um, and as much as we, we talk about he'll never, you know, bench Gino, eight turnovers in four games will get you benched by Pete Carroll. Um, and then the that's other like the one thing you can position. do. <laughs> um, right. And the fact that he didn't have any against uh, the commanders is the only reason why the team won. Because the offense didn't get enough done otherwise. If they were turning the ball over and giving the ball to, you know, the commanders with short fields, I mean, that could have gone badly. Um, but they took care of the football. The defense did its job and, and collected turnovers, and it got them a win. Um, and you've got to do that. you got to keep doing that. You've got to, to continue to hold on to the football. And you've got to be op- opportunistic on defense. And if the team does that, gets back to Pete Carroll football um, in terms of how it you know takes care of the football. Um, yeah, I mean, that's just, that's what I expect. Just straight like I expect this team to take care of the football and um, get a turnover here and there from the defense. And when so that seems each, to be when the turnover differential in each game by one or two. That's what this team needs to do. So that would obviously be one of the keys to the game here. Um, do you have any other keys to this uh, game, Keith? Um, and let's get into our predictions. I want to see this team get the running game going better. Um, Walker's been running fine. Charbonnet's been running better. Um, give both of those guys some carries. I think they, we had a total of 19 carries in the last game. That needs to be 24, 28. If you're converting on third and downs, you know, get that number of carries up there. It's, there's no reason not to. It'll slow down the pass rush. It'll um, give Aaron Donald something to do other than try and kill Geno Smith. And it also opens up the play action game. And Geno Smith is at his best when he's got the play action pass going. His play fake is really solid and um, you put him on the run, you put him on the move, you give him um, that kind of those kind of openings that play action does and he can pick teams apart. Uh, But to do that, you got to get the run game going. If the team knows they can stop your running game without doing anything different, um, then you're going to be in trouble because you can't really do play action and have it actually do any damage. Uh, so they you really sound like uh, Shane Waldron in his weekly press conference this last week. Basically, what? he was ta- Shane Waldron. He was basically just talking about the same sorts of things that you were talking about. Why the team hasn't been effective in running the ball this this year? Some of it's been situational. The other things that he pointed to was their down conversion opportunities and um, extending drives and so forth as as the factors in limiting carries. And mm-hmm. um, other than that, they do definitely want to run the ball. They want to run the ball more. That's a focus point. He kind of came out and said that. Um, so, yeah, for sure. And Charbonnet, I mean, my goodness, he, I love, you know, he kind of got in trouble a little bit with Pete on that one carry where he, uh, instead of going out of bounds towards the end of the game um, in our last drive, he just took it to the chin of a defender um, before he, you know, he kind of fell out of bounds the clock kept going though. So they had to burn the timeout. Um, but I love that attitude. I mean, that's what I was talking about. Um, a couple podcasts ago when we were talking about identity, 
uh, for this team and love to see that really. Okay. So let's get to predictions. Uh, Keith, why don't you go? Let me know what you think. So I think Seattle's offense comes together a little bit more on this and, and, and they start to finally get it to work. Um, saw some things in the second half last week that gave me some optimism. And if the offense starts to put it together, I don't expect them to be like they were last year where they're putting up over 30 points a game yet. Um, Cause the, the offensive line still needs to figure it out. But if they start figuring out some of the stuff, uh, then I think Seattle can score on this team and 27 points isn't out, out of, um, out of the realm of possibility. And I think that, you know, the Rams are going to probably be able to move the ball a little bit. They've got, um, they've got some weapons, you know, uh, Pukunakua and, uh, Cooper cup, uh, give you some, some place for, for, uh, Stafford to go with the ball. They're going to get some third down conversions because of it. And I think they're going to score some too, but I, I still think that Seattle is going to come out on top of this one, something like, um, you know, 27, 23. Interesting. Yeah. I don't see the Rams scoring, um, against this defense as much. Um, they've, they've been averaging 19.8 points this year so far. Um, I think they're a little under that when they face this defense. I think our defense is better than advertised. Um, they, I, I don't know what happened um, with with the Ravens game, but I think they got a little bit more back on track with Washington. And um, I see that same thing happening here with the Rams. I don't think this is a special offense, the sort of offense we've seen in the past from the Rams. And then on, on offense, I do believe at some point, we're going to be able to turn the corner and Gino uh, and company are going to be able to put four quarters together um, where they can effectively move the ball, put up a ton of offense and a ton of points. So I see that as being this game. Um, I'm thinking probably in the thirties somewhere for the Seahawks. Let's just say 32, 32 to 17 is my final score. Wow. So you're, you're predicting a blowout. I'm predicting it. Yeah. Double, double up that score against them. Probably a couple turnovers is going to need to to happen in order for us to get, to get to that. But, um, I, I think with the guys like boy, i uh, creating pressures, uh, quarterback hits and sacks the way that he's been doing some of the other guys benefit from that on our defense, as well as guys on the back end, Witherspoon and Woolen and company are going to be able to uh, generate a couple turnovers. So that's the way I see it. Cool. And then, and then we get to move on to the next week's game, which I'm really looking forward to. I just can't, I, it's hard for me to fathom that the team is, is not looking past this Rams game a little bit and looking towards that 49er matchup. I hope they're not, but I can't help myself. Like mm-hmm. that, that game is just so it's just sitting there like waiting to, to, you know, cause that's going to be, that's going to be a huge, intriguing, massive storyline uh, this week. If we can get past this, this game right here. Oh so. yeah. If you get it, when, when, whenever this game ends, especially if Seattle wins this game and sets up a, um, battle for first place on Thanksgiving against the 49ers, that is going to be the biggest game of the weekend. And that'll be fun. But see, so yeah, yeah. before it happens, Seattle's got to get past the Rams. They've got to get this one done. Yeah. All right. Let's go do it. Let's go do it. Let's have a great game. Fun game. Let's get this win. Um, go ahead and, and uh, go find Keith on Twitter at Myers NFL. You can find me at NWC Hawk. Find your favorite podcast platform and subscribe to the show and also our YouTube channel. Um, hit that subscribe button. Make sure you get each show in your feed every week. So until next time, go Hawks. Go Hawks. Seahawks Playbook Podcast listeners, thanks for joining us for another edition of the show. You can find us on Twitter. Bill is at NW Seahawk. Keith is at Myers NFL. And the show is at Hawks Playbook. You can listen and subscribe to the show at SeahawksPlaybook.com.